That is such a funny video. There's actually quite an interesting story behind this cookie test. And I see I've got yet another cookie on here. Every service, the cookie gets larger. <laughs> My pants get tighter. So, hey kids, if you've got those gummies, those fruit snacks you want to eat, you might as well go ahead. I'll start too. That video is based on some research. Stanford University, Walter Miskell, was conducting his daughter was one of the kids in the experiment. And the study actually followed these children for years from when they were little all the way through school, through high school, through university, into the workplace. And sure enough, the research indicated that the kids that had higher self-control were outpacing their peers. They scored higher in university entrance exams. They had stronger relationships and reporting greater satisfaction. And on this happiness scale, however they measured that, they came out ahead of everybody else. In fact, another physician, I'm full of cookie here, I gotta swallow this, <laughs> and psychologist, his name is Leonard Sachs. He asked this question, see if you can answer it. Which factor measured when a child is 11 years old is the best predictor of happiness and life satisfaction when that child becomes a young adult? It's on the cover of your handout. Self-control, Self there you go, somebody's got it, thank you. Some of you have read books by Malcolm Gladwell. He's an interesting author. He has a best-selling book called Outliers, The Story of Success. And he looks at extraordinary people and wonders what makes them so successful. Business people like Bill Gates, sports stars, musicians, classical composers, somebody like Mozart. What makes them rise to the very top? And the one thing he learned was this. Successful people practice a lot. They're self-disciplined. In fact, he believes there's this magic number of 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours practice that moves you from the middle of the pack to way out in front. One year, one month, three weeks, non-stop. That's what it takes. It made me wonder, could self-control be one of these outliers for us as together we seek to build lives that honor God? Just maybe then, it's no surprise that 2,000 years before Malcolm Gladwell wrote his book, the Holy Spirit was prompting the Apostle Paul to include self-control when he wrote to the church about the fruit of the Spirit, when he said this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no rules, there's no laws against any of this. Now, I have a confession to make here. Some of you would know Pastor Grant was actually scheduled to preach this weekend and he got sick, so I'm the, kind of the nobody who's up here at the very last minute trying to make some sense of what's going on. That's not the problem. The problem is to do with my medication. You guys know that I take stuff for my tremor. The neurologist keeps switching and changing meds. I take a medication whose principal side effect is to inhibit your self-control mechanisms. <laughs> it's not funny, don't laugh. I am trying to keep my job. <laughs> How am I supposed to talk to anybody about self-control when I'm medicating it out of myself at rapid pace? It's not easy. She warned me about gambling. She warned me about online activities. She warned me about shopping. I'm not the best person to be talking about self-control today. But here goes. What is it? There are a bunch of fun definitions. Somebody said it's choosing to do right when you want to do the wrong thing. It's knowing you can, but deciding not to anyway. Or just this, it's not eating all the popcorn before the movie starts. <laughs> when the Apostle Paul wrote about this in his own language, the word that he chose for self-control really means power over yourself or self-government, governing yourself. It's this dimension of self-control that he actually talks more about when he's in a debate with some of his friends in a letter. They've been asking questions and saying things to him. He's responding. And the sort of thing goes on. They say, I have the right to do anything. And he's going, yeah, but not everything's beneficial. And they're repeating it. I have the right to do anything. And he says, yeah, but I will not be mastered by anything. Self-mastery, self-government, self-control. That's what's going on here. But why is it important? Why does it really matter? I mean, some instances we get that it seems straightforward why you'd want to get a grip of yourself. But there's an interesting proverb in the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament that reads like this. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. 
You would know as well as I do that in ancient times, city walls were really important. If you've ever been to Europe, you'd have seen some walled cities. The oldest walled city in North America is Quebec City. They were there for defense, strong defensive structures. Way back in the times of Nineveh, when it was the capital of the ancient Assyrian Empire, people said, at least at the estimate, the walls were so wide, you could put three chariots on it and race it about. It would be like having the chuck wagon races on top of a wall. Now, the metaphor doesn't really do a whole lot for us anymore, unless you live in the States and you're interested in walls. We can't even get a ring road finished, so. <laughs> but we know what a wall's about. And the principle's still the same without protection. Without the wall, we're left unprotected without self control. We're left unprotected. We know full well God doesn't live in a special city like Jerusalem. He doesn't even live in a particular temple that people might try to build for him. We realize that God has made his temple and his dwelling place in the hearts and lives of his people. But the principle is the same. Without self-control, we are left unprotected. And that means that there are things that we want to be saying no to. You see, self-control is about boundaries. It's about saying no to some things. It's about saying not yet to some things. It's about saying not or saying enough to some things. This is the vocabulary of self-control. And no, not now and enough. They're words that protect us from ourselves as well as make space in our lives to enjoy this relationship with a living God. That's why Jesus' friend Peter wrote this. And he reminded us saying, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control. But here's the thing that gets me. As we've gone through this summer series that's called More, we've been looking at all these virtues, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And when we think about those things, we come to understand God is growing this in our lives. He's actually changing us. The fruit begins to burst forth in our lives. People see it, your friends, your colleagues see it. We even notice it ourselves. God is actually changing us. But self-control... That just sounds like hard work. It sounds difficult. It seems like a contradiction. At one point, we're being told this is the fruit of the Spirit, something the Holy Spirit will put into our lives. And yet, at the same time, we're being told we have to work at it. We have to add it to our lives. We need to do something or not do something. No, not yet. Enough. So how does it all come together? How do we glue this together? Throughout this series, we've reminded ourselves of some of the words of Jesus in John chapter 15 when he said, apart from me, you can't do anything. He described himself as the vine and we are the branches. The branch, he says, has to abide in the vine. We have to abide with Jesus. The focus of these branches in his metaphor is they're not thinking about fruit. They're thinking about the vine stock. They're thinking about Jesus. When we stay connected to Jesus, the fruit has a root. And so the effort that might be involved is not what we think it is. The effort that's involved is staying close to Jesus. It can happen in a number of ways. And you gathered here this morning in this big room or watching online would know prayer would be part of that. Having a conversation with God, speaking to him, listening for his voice. Reading our Bibles would be part of that journey as well. Opening up God's word to see how he would speak to us and speak into the situations we face. Do you know that if you worked at your life, anything you wanted to do in life, and you aimed for 1% improvement per day, over the course of a whole year, 365 days, you'd get a 3,300% return. That's impressive. I mean, imagine you started praying and reading your Bible for just one minute a day. That's not long. You'd hardly get it open until you'd be done. One minute a day. And you increased that by 1% every day. A day two, you'd be at one minute and one second. 72 days, just over two months, you'd be at two minutes. 144 days, getting up towards five months, you'd be at four minutes. A whole year of doing this, you'd be at 34 minutes. 15 months, more than an hour. Two years, 18 hours a day, you'd barely have time to sleep and eat. But it really is about listening and obeying. It's this idea that we don't set the agenda. We submit to the will of God, and when we submit consistently, it's called self-control. So where do we go to get started in this topic of self-control? 
Here's one practical illustration I think that all of us could understand and work with. It's in the book of James in your Bible if you've got it with you or you'd like to use one in the chair back in front of you. If you have the FAC Experience app, the words should be loaded up for you. And if you're watching online, the words will appear on the screen. We're looking at James chapter 3, verse 1. Here's what he writes. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I'm not particularly happy about this verse in the Bible, just saying. <laughs> we all stumble in many ways, and anyone who is never at fault in, any, in any, what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by the strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He's telling us that words matter. They give shape to our reality in a way that we need to pay close attention to. He uses two metaphors, one about a horse, one about a ship. He says both the destiny of the horse and the destiny of the ship are determined by a small piece of equipment. The bit steers the horse, the rudder steers the ship. And James says our words steer our lives. In 1984, there's a British writer, and he was a Scrabble fanatic. How do you get a job like this? Anyway... His name is Giles Brandred, and he predicted, I don't know how he came up with a number, but he predicted that the average person in life speaks 860,341,500 words. Just so you wonder how many that is, that's if you started reading your Bible out loud and you read it out loud 1,100 times, you would get to roughly the amount of words. That's a lot of talking. The point here that James is making is, if that's true that we speak 800 million words, any one of them or any few of them can seem fairly insignificant. But on the whole, they steer the trajectory of your life. They determine where you end up. I mean, think about it. With your words, you could land a job. With your words, you could build a relationship or have a family. You could build community. With your words, you could build a culture at home or in your workplace. Your words could also land you in a heap of trouble, though. Your words might get you that first date. Your words might bring that first date to a rapid conclusion. Words matter. And when we stop and think about it, this all makes sense. We get this. Words impact our lives. But not only do they shape our reality, they shape our internal reality as well. Some of you are verbal processors. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you are married to a verbal processor and you really know what I'm talking about. Words shape reality. But in the second half of verse 5, James brings in another metaphor, one that we can understand, a wildfire, a forest fire. And he compares the tongue to the spark that sets it off. The implication is that words that we use don't just steer the direction of our own life. They have a direct impact in the lives of others. Reality changing impact in the lives of others. Like fire or words spread. You start a chain reaction. They set in series this motion of erratic, difficult to stop, destructive events. Not just for us, but for the people round about us. Some of us know that chain reaction all too well. We've lived in destructive experience in relationships. We've felt those experiences. We know what it's like when people are unkind or when they're dismissive, when people make us feel insignificant or not good enough, when we have been told that we're inadequate. We know the power of words. Some of us might think, well, I don't actually have a problem with this. I don't have a problem with holding my tongue. Maybe. 
I read this thing by a guy, a rabbi called Toluskin. He's an author and speaker. He wrote this book called Words That Heal and Words That Hurt. And he asked a simple question. I wanted to do it. See if you can respond to the question with me. How many of you have gone for the past 24 hours without seeing anything negative to anybody? Same response every other service. He says the same response he asked that question to, a little bit of nervous laughter and no hands up. Then he writes this, those who can't answer yes need to recognize you've got a serious problem. If you can't go 24 hours without drinking alcohol, you're an alcoholic. If you can't go 24 hours without smoking substance, a substance, you know you're addicted to it. And if you can't go 24 hours without saying something unkind to somebody, you've lost control over your tongue. Jesus, James uses strong language when he talks about this. He starts bringing in the imagery of the very fires of hell. I think that's because our words destroy relationships. And James is reminding us that people are made in the image of God. Everybody. We're the very apex of God's creation. And therefore, we become the target of the enemy of our souls. And when we use words to pull people down or destroy people or ruin their reputation when we hurt them, we're working hand in glove with the very enemy of our soul. That's why James uses such strong language. Every one of us has got our own struggle in this area. And that's why he reminds us it's a big deal because he says if you could control your tongue, you'd control yourself. The apostle Paul wrote to some of his friends and said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. There's a simple acronym you could use to help you here. Many of you have heard it before or wrote it down. If you want to grab a pen and a piece of paper, you can scribble quickly. The acronym's based on the word THINK. Think about what you say. The T, is it true? If I don't know, well, then I don't need to say it. The H is for helpful. Is it helpful? Will this actually bless somebody? Will they feel better because I've taught, said this to them? The I is for inspiring. Is it inspiring? Is this going to encourage somebody? The N, is it necessary? Do I really need to repeat the information that I've received? Is any of this necessary? And the K, is it kind? Or am I just being selfish and a gossip? think. And if what you say doesn't match up, maybe it'd be better just to say nothing at all. At one time, the, a good while ago, the guy who was at the time CEO of Pizza Hut used to make phone calls to VIP customers at the end of every week. Friday in his lunch break, he'd phone a few people up, tell them that he appreciated their business. There's a story written down of a time he phoned a lady in Houston, said who he was, and she thought it was a prank call, so she hung up immediately. He called back and he actually got into a conversation. He thanked her for her business and asked her about her story and she told him. She's a single mom, working three jobs to make end meet. She's got four kids. She's really struggling and the reason she buys so much pizza is she's got very little time to actually take care of the situation at home to provide for her kids. He listened to her, praised her for her work ethic, thanked her for her business and told her that she was a good mom. Her version of the story as she recounts it she started crying. No one had ever told her she was a good mom before. They just pointed out all of her inadequacies, the things she couldn't do. She went on to say she'd never forget the day somebody told her she was good. A 20-minute phone call. We all have the opportunity to speak words of life and hope and love to somebody else, a call, a text, a message, spend some time with somebody. We all have those opportunities. The power of our words is huge. But there's something underlying all this talk of self-control. Do you know what it is? I think it's desire. We have to have the right desire. If it's going to spill over into all the other aspects of life, we need some all-controlling desire that leads us in the right direction and centers are where we go. That's a desire for Jesus. That's what it is. No, not now enough. They're the vocabulary of self-control because they are words about desire and about satisfaction. No, I don't need that. Not now. I'm already satisfied. Enough. I am more than satisfied. Is Jesus your desire and satisfaction? Right now, today, he could be. Right now, today, literally, you could reach out to him in faith. You could invite him into your life. You could make him front and central. You could turn right around from an old way of living and be welcome to a brand new life and a brand new reality, beginning the adventure of following Jesus. Are you ready? 
Here's what happens when we do that, when Jesus becomes our desire. We change where we stand. In Psalm 19, verse 14, there's a beautiful prayer that says this, May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The first part of that prayer is a petition. It's a request that God would align what we say, the literal words that come out of our mouths with his heart, with his purpose, with his will, with God's intention, that we could learn to speak kind words of blessing. The other part of the verse makes this very crucial acknowledgement. The Lord is my rock and my redeemer. <clears throat> Those things go together. We really have to start with that acknowledgement that unless we stand in front of God and receive his blessing, we can't bless others. Unless we understand the truth of God's love and the, his redemption, the way he weaves the broken strands of our lives back into something whole and beautiful, unless it finds its way into the core of our being, our struggle with words will forever be a losing battle. You know why? Why? Because this awareness of the truth that God's heart is toward us is where we find our identity. It's where we find our security. It's where we find our community. Without it, we become reactive. We become defensive. Sometimes we feel the need to lower somebody down in the hope we can elevate ourselves up a little bit. We feel the need to protect ourselves. We've got something to prove. We boast. We gossip. This affirmation, the Lord is my rock and my redeemer. It's the psalmist's way of saying, it's okay, I know where I stand, and that makes me free to bless others. This is why James acknowledges the importance of using our words to worship God. He says, when your worship is authentic, when it's real, there will be ripple effects. It will be a chain reaction in the rest of your life. Your words will be redeemed. They will reflect the heart of somebody who's met and know Jesus, and others will discover Jesus in your words. We change where we stand. We also change what we see. James doesn't go into all of this, but he does give us a hint in verse 9 when he's talking about when things go sideways for us. He says, with the tongue, we curse those who are made in God's likeness. The implication is we shouldn't curse people. We shouldn't say bad things about them. We shouldn't be unkind or harsh with them because they're the image bearers of God himself. They have his representative likeness. He's saying that every time we do that to another, we do it to God. And I know some of you are sitting here going, really? I mean, it sounds great in theory, but you've never met my partner. You've never met my 13-year-old stepson. You haven't met my boss. This image of God stuff might be fine in theory, but when I look at them, I see Voldemort. <laughs> James acknowledges that this is hard. To change our vision, to change what we see, so we can see the image of God in other people, particularly those we dislike or who have wounded or hurt us, to see God in them, that's hard. But when we change what we see, and we change the words that we affirm them with, we do more than just have this chain reaction in our life. We're actually drawing that person closer to Jesus. We actually draw that person a little closer to Jesus. So here's what I think God's invitation is to us today. It comes through the prophet Isaiah. And God says, come, you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come. Come. Buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money and without cost. It's this invitation. You don't need to work to yourself to death for things that are not going to satisfy. God's saying, let me feed you. Let me take care of you. I'll feed your soul. I will satisfy you to the very core of your being. And then you'll be appropriately satisfied. And when you're satisfied, you can say, not now, enough. You've learned self-control. If that's the invitation... What might the response be? In Psalm 63, we read these words, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I'll praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I'll lift up my hands. I'll be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. And with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I'll remember you. 
I'll think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you and your right hand upholds me. He's saying, yes, Lord, I am thirsty. My soul is parched and I am going to respond to your invitation. I'm going to come and let you satisfy the need of my soul. I need Jesus. We talk often about downward spirals in life. This is an upward spiral. I'm dry and I'm thirsty. And I'm seeking you, God. And I find you and you feed my soul and you satisfy me. And I cling on to you. And as I cling on to you, I never want to let go. I want more of who you are. And I love that last verse. I cling to you. And your right hand holds me up. It's a beautiful picture. That what enables us to cling on to God is the very fact that God is holding on to us and he's promised never to let go. But you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking there are some of us here or some of you watching online and something's happened. A single act. A momentary lapse of self-control. Maybe a series of poor choices. And you've screwed up. You know you have. You've messed up your life. Your heart's filled with regret. You're living with a bunch of consequences you never foresaw. You don't know where to go. You wish you could start all over again, but you know in your heart there's not much chance of that. There's a story in the Bible that I wanted you to pay attention to. If you went to Sunday school when you were little, you might remember the story of Samson. You find it in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. Little baby boy born to his parents, they dedicated him. They dedicated him in a particular way in their time and culture to be a Nazarite. It meant he would live his whole life specially dedicated to God and as symbols of it, he wouldn't cut his hair and he wouldn't drink alcohol. That was the plan. A man who would be completely dedicated to God and as he grew, God made him enormously strong. He became a warrior. But his life was the exact opposite of his parents' dream. He was anything but dedicated to God. His life was completely out of control like an adolescent mind in a full-grown man's body. He played foolish tricks on his parents and his friends, hurting many people along the way. He was completely out of control in his relationships with women. Finally, he got involved with a woman from the natural enemies of his people. She's a Philistine lady called Delilah. He got closer and closer to the edge, but he thought he could make it all the way to the precipice because he was in control not knowing that every decision he made was eroding his ability to have self-control. Till one day he toppled over the edge. Everybody wanted to know the secret of his strength and he told her one night that it was because he hadn't cut his hair. God had given him the strength. They captured him, they shaved his head, they tortured and brutalized him, they poked his eyes out and they had him chained up ready to kill him. And Samson prayed one last desperate prayer. God, give me one more chance. Give me my strength back. And his strength came back and the chains that were attached to the pillars, he pulled, the pillars fell down. A lot of people died. How's that a hopeful story? It's hopeful because we read in Hebrews chapter 11 this amazing story of the heroes of the faith and we read this. Look who shows up. What more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. What in the world is Samson doing in that list? I don't really know. I don't know how he got there. But he is there. Maybe it was that last desperate prayer. Maybe it was that last desperate plea to God, his last prayer of faith. But here's why there's hope. There's hope because there is not one of us sitting here or watching online. There is not one of us that ever has gone too far. It doesn't matter who you are where you've been, what you've done, or who you've done it with. It doesn't matter as far as God's concerned. This might be the first time you've heard about Jesus, or you could have been following Jesus for a very long time. Maybe your life's been out of control forever, and maybe it only started yesterday. It doesn't matter to God. You're never too far away. God is ready to meet with you today and bring hope and bring healing and bring renewal to your life that your past mistakes are no longer fatal. Your past does not have to determine your future, but with Jesus, there is a hope, there is a future, there is a life, and there is a fresh beginning. It is not too late. And if you're thirsty, Jesus says, come. And if you're hungry, Come, I'll feed your soul. You will be satisfied. 
cling on to me. And I will put my arm around you and I will never let you go. So Father, we pray today because we find ourselves in need. There's not many of us could raise our hands to say that we got enough self-control over our words. Probably means we don't have it in other aspects of life too. So I want to pray. I want to pray for people that don't know Jesus this morning. And if that's you, just pray with me and say this. Jesus, I'm here and I need you and I know where my life's going and it's not pretty. And I need your help. I want you to forgive me for the things that I have done that have hurt you and hurt others and hurt me. I need you to help me turn my life around and that's probably complicated. I want to become your follower and I'm going to need help to do that too. And so I pray today that you would encounter me in a profound way. Give me that second chance and make my life brand new. And Father, for whoever's praying that, I pray right now that you would welcome them into your family, that they would know that everything, everything is different right now. And I also want to pray, Father, for some of us gathered here watching at home. And we've made a poor choice. And self-control evaporated and we're in trouble and we need help. Lord, I pray that you would come to us and that we would know that you wrap your right arm around us and you hold us. Help us to begin again. We pray for courage. We pray for grace. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for hope that you would set us free and help us to get going in this journey with you. The truth is we've thought all summer long about more, more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more goodness, more faithfulness, more gentleness, more self-control. And we're sitting here crying out, Lord, we need more of you. We need you to come and reshape our lives till people see Jesus in us. So thank you for your presence. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for speaking to us today. May our hearts cry always be to say yes to you and to cling on to the one who holds us most. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.